uh, to, uh, to connect people to Christ. That's our hope. That's our goal. That's our passion as a church. We just want to see people get connected with Christ. And if you're here today and you're, you're checking out Jesus, maybe you haven't been in church in a long time, or maybe you doubt there's even a God, we are glad that you're here this morning. And we just want to let you know that we're, we're here to walk through with you through any doubts or challenges you may face. And uh, we just want connection with God. That's what we want, connection with Christ for you and your life. So we are glad glad that you are here this morning. And uh, we're continuing, we're jumping back on the Letters from Patmos train. We jumped off the train about a month ago because I wanted to do something else. We had a, God had laid a different message on my heart. And so now we're jumping back on the train. We've got three messages, including this morning, uh, left in this series. And I got to tell you, the first thing that I learned in this whole process here was that I'm never doing another nine-week series again. It's too long. It's too much. I just, we can't do it anymore. So there'll probably be no more nine, ten week uh, message series. Uh, but today we're going to be uh, at the letter to the church in Sardis, with it, which is in Revelation chapter three. And so if you're familiar with that, you're welcome to turn there. We're going to be reading from that in a few minutes. But uh, before we read the text, let's start with a question. Does anybody know anyone who is arrogant? Do we know any arrogant people? The person that thinks they no more than everyone else, always have the right answers to the questions. They're never wrong. I mean, one of my daughters tells me about a friend of hers that if she says it, it's true, okay? You are not allowed to discuss it once she has spoken it because it is the truth at that point in time. And so all of us know those kind of people, right? Now, how many of us have ever been that person at one point in time in our lives? Oh, yeah, I, I'm guilty of that. I can do that every once in a while. I can think I know everything and I'm right. And, uh, but arrogant people, they don't give you warm, fuzzy feelings, do they? You don't feel good about them, do you? I mean, if you're working with one, if, you're, if you've got a job where you're working as a team and one of your team members is that arrogant person, and you're not as holy as some other people, you're maybe thinking of ways to devise to get them off of your team, like hoping they'll catch the flu so that they'll miss a week of work so you won't have to deal with them and stuff like that, right? I mean, that's how we feel. That's how I feel about arrogant people. Now, how about this question? How about arrogant churches? Ooh, yeah. Some of you said, what? And some of you said, go on, preach, preacher. There's arrogant churches out there. And so, how does that happen? How do churches become arrogant? See, churches become arrogant when they receive the right information from God, but that information is applied in an incorrect way. And so let me illustrate that to you. All of us have heard the phrase, give God your best, right? And I think that's a pretty sound biblical principle because as you look at the life of Jesus, as you look at God and everything he's done, he's never given us second rate. He's never given us third best. God has always been about giving us his best. And so we can see how that information is relevant to our lives because, okay, God has given his best and so therefore we should give God our best. But how does this information get misapplied? It gets misapplied like this. I had this conversation one time at another church that I was at. It wasn't this church, and so don't be looking around the room trying to figure out who it is I was talking to. But uh, there was a man who uh, had been coming to our church, and he was a regular. He was there all the time. Well, suddenly, we, he stopped showing up. We didn't see him. And uh, he was gone for about a month. I didn't know what was going on. And so finally, after about a month of Sundays being gone, he shows up at church. And so I see him and I come up and I'm like, hey, Mike, what's going on, man? I haven't seen you in about a month. And what he said to me was this. He said, yeah, I've been sick and the doctors have put me on steroids and I've gained a lot of weight from the steroids. And so now the only clothes that fit me are my jeans and I didn't want to come to church in a pair of jeans. And so I stayed home for the last month. And there were three of us in this conversation. I said to Mike, I said, Mike, no, um, God would rather have you here connecting with people and helping, having people around you to help you to walk through this sickness that you're going through rather than having you sitting at home by yourself, isolated with no one else to support you and lift you up. The third man in the conversation says, wait a minute, he's got a point here. And I said, what do you mean he's got a point? Well, God wants our best. 
And if he couldn't go out to the store and afford to buy new slacks and a new shirt and some new shoes, then it's probably best if he stayed home because he wouldn't be giving God his best. I was absolutely blown away by this conversation because it's like who would tell somebody to stay home because you cannot wear a suit, because you cannot wear slacks and a collar shirt, because you cannot wear a certain kind of shoes. See, that's a misapplication of a principle from God's word. And let me, let me just have you think about that like this. I bought a suit about two years ago it was September two years ago. The suit cost me $275. I had youth that would come to, a, uh, come to church or come to a youth service. They would be wearing a $130 pair of Nikes, okay? $300 true religion jeans. Does anybody in here own true religion? I want to know where you got your money from because those things are expensive, okay? And a $50 shirt. His clothes were far better, more expensive than mine in me being in a suit. And so really, who was giving God their best, the guy in the suit or the guy in the $300 true religion jeans? But see, when we take God's word and we misapply it, it leads to spiritual problems, and spiritual problems eventually lead to spiritual death. And that's where this church in Sardis was at. They were on the verge of going to die. And before we read the text, I want to take a little journey into this city and so you can see who Sardis is. This city was very old. It had been around a long time. And, and like a lot of the other cities in this book, what, it had been, what they had done is they had built it on a cliff, okay? And so, so they built it on this cliff. And cliffs were easy to defend from armies because they were hard to get up. And so this, church, or this, uh, this, this city was able to build itself into a prosperous and well city because they had easy defenses. It was hard to invade their city. And so, and so there they were. They were... They were, they were there, they were being successful, they were, they were prospering, they were making money because nobody was able to invade them, but they had an extra advantage. See, in the, around the city there were these springs, and in these springs there was gold. And so the, city, the people, how they made their money was by mining gold. And actually, this is the first city in the world where they actually minted a gold coin, okay? That was the very first city that actually minted a gold coin. But there was so much gold in the springs surrounding the city that the, uh, a rumor started that uh, King Midas, do you guys all know who King Midas is? The guy who would touch things and they would turn to gold? The rumor is that King Midas, before he died, brought all of his treasure to the city of Sardis and dropped it in the springs, and that's why there was so much gold around there. <coughs> and, and this was also the city that invented the process for dyeing wool, and so uh, they had a very prosperous wool trade. So this city was wealthy, it was prosperous, and people moved from all over the Roman Empire to make the money that flowed from the city. And so with that, let's head to our text this morning. Uh, if you're familiar with Revelation, uh, please feel free to turn there for anyone who's new to the church, to the Bible, or fam church. Um, Revelation, if you go to the very end of your Bible and you start paging uh, the other way, you're going to run into it because it's the last book in your Bible. <coughs> Excuse me, I got something caught in my throat. And so just go to the end and start paging backwards. If you're not able to find it, that's, that's fine. Um, We're going to have it on the screen behind me. Um, This is what it says. We're going to be reading Revelation chapter 3, and we're going to do verses 1 through 6 today. Uh, And it says this, To the angel of the church in Sardis write, and uh, Mike, you can go ahead and uh, let the people know. Could somebody please grab me some water? I've got dust in my throat, and I'm not going to be able to make it through this. (laughs) To the angel in the church of Sardis write, These are the words of him (laughs) who holds the seven spirits of God, And the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. Thank you. I will come like a thief. 
and you will know, not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that my name before, I will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right, so with this church... <laughs> I hope that you notice that Jesus had nothing nice to say to this church, okay? Um, all the other churches, Jesus was all nice. He was all friendly with them. But this church, it's like a football coach that went into the locker room at halftime with his team down 42 to nothing. Yeah, you know, Jesus just comes in and hammers them. I mean, has anybody been on a team that's been losing big at halftime? Has the coach been a nice guy at halftime? No, usually there's some colorful language and there's some, there's some other things. There's red faces, there's spit flying everywhere. It's just a sea of craziness, right? Or maybe it's like you go to answer your door, somebody rings your doorbell and you open the door and they just punch you in the face and walk away. I mean, that's what Jesus does here. He just walks in and he just hits this church. He's got nothing good to say about this church. He says, look, guys, you are about to die. And none of us would want to hear that, would we? We wouldn't want to walk in someplace and have somebody say, you're about to die. Especially if it's coming from our Lord, coming from our Savior, Jesus. He says, though, you have a reputation of being alive, but you're really not. You're dead. And if you don't step up to the plate and fix it, you're literally going to be dead. The church needed to get unstuck. If they didn't get unstuck, they were done. Now the deal is that Jesus never tells us what the church issues are, what the problems are that got the church stuck in the first place. And so, so let's look at this. What causes churches to get stuck? What causes churches to die? The first thing that causes churches to die is that they move from being a place of advancing the mission of Jesus to a religious institution. Some of you are thinking, what does that mean? Because I thought a church was a religious institution. And the answer to that is not all cut and dried. Here is the definition of religion, okay? Religion is defined as an organized system of beliefs, ceremonies, and rules used to worship a god or a group of gods. And yes, we have some of that. But what we need to know is that Jesus did not come to create rules, ceremonies, and organized systems. Jesus came to destroy the sin that wrecks our lives and separates us from God. He came to for us to be able to establish a personal relationship with him. And to pull apart, and also he was pulling apart the religious system that was created in his name. There had been a religious system that had been set up and Jesus was, came to kind of pull this thing down because that religious system, instead of pulling people closer to God, was pushing people further away from God. But see, we as humans, we don't like that. We like to have a cut and dry system, right? We like to have something in place. We want rules that we can point to. We want ceremonies that we can be a part of. And we want defined beliefs that says who does and who does not belong. And because of that, churches have the tendency to go from missions focused to rules focused, ceremonies focused, and belief focused. So instead of caring about those that are far from God and the mission that he has put us on, we start to care about the types of clothes that people wear who are coming to church. Instead of trying to figure out how to be a lighthouse in our community, we care more about the stature and the status of those who go to our church. Instead of showing people how to share our faith, we're there to point fingers at those inside and outside the church for the sin that they are committing, but that finger never gets pointed back at ourselves. And instead of praying for those that are far from God, we tell people how they should act, but do not do those very things ourselves. And the deal is, is that this kind of picture describes some people in the New Testament. It describes the Pharisees. And the guy that we looked at last week, Nicodemus, he was one of these Pharisees. He was one of these religious guys. He was one of these guys that, that was part of this religious system that Jesus came to break up. And, and Jesus, for his part, in his life, spent his time as, uh, rebuking these guys, getting in these guys' face, telling them what he thought of them. Jesus was always after these men who were the Pharisees, who were the religious leaders. And some of the most intense times, one of the most intense times is found in Matthew chapter 23, and we're not going to read the whole chapter because we don't have time, but he lights these guys up, the whole chapter, that's all he does is he's just like, bam, bam. 
bam, bam, hitting them over and over and over again. And so let's, let's just hit the highlights of what Jesus says to them. Jesus says, man, you come and you wear all the nicest clothes and get honored when you walk through the room because of who you are. And that's what you're after. Jesus says, you know what, they tell people how to live their lives, but they themselves won't lift a finger to help them live or to help them uh, live the life that God is calling them to live. They make sure that they look good on the outside, but they don't deal with the sin that's on the inside of them. They tithe, they give up everything they possess. However, there's not an ounce of mercy and grace in their lives for people who are struggling. Jesus says they sit as judge and jury and that they tell people whether or not they're going to enter into heaven. And here's my guess. The church of Sardis had become this very thing. They were more concerned about what others thought of them. They were more concerned with the sin of those that sat around them in church than they were with their own sin. They were more concerned with telling others how to live rather than actually living it themselves. They were not out there telling people about Jesus and how he could set them free. And we kind of know this because this was the only church in the book of Revelation that you're going to find that the church was not persecuted. This is the only church that people weren't going after them, that the Roman Empire wasn't going after them, that those that worshiped the emperor weren't going after them, that the Jews in the city weren't going after them. And my guess is they had become so focused on pointing at each other and calling each other out for sins and, and, and saying, I'm this and I'm that, and I'm better than you, and all of these things, that the church had become irrelevant. It was no longer making an impact in their city. And so there was no need for them to undergo persecution because they were doing absolutely nothing. They'd become a religious organization where they cared about the outward appearance, where they cared about pointing the finger at the other people in the church rather than dealing with the sin they had inside of themselves. And that's the thing. See, when we're doing that, we think we're alive. Why do we think we're alive? Well, because Jesus, we see over and over again him pointing his finger at people for their sins. But see, the people Jesus pointed at was always the religious. The religious came to Jesus in a, in a book called John in chapter 8 with a woman who was caught in adultery. And they brought her to Jesus and they said, Jesus, this woman was caught in adultery. What should we do with her? Should we stone her? They were hoping that Jesus was going to say, yeah, let's nail this chick. That was the wrong phrase to use, wasn't it? All right, let's, let's hit this. <laughs> Um, yeah, that would, that's a hard one to recover. Let's hit this. Let's, let's, let's throw rocks at her. All right, let's, let's go with that one. All right. Um, and instead, Jesus looks at her and says, okay, whoever has no sin, you can throw the first stone. What happened? Everybody went away because they realized that they had sin. Jesus is saying, look, look at yourselves. Don't worry about everyone else. There's enough needs, there's enough things going on in your life that you don't need to worry about everyone else that's sitting around you. It's like the story of a runner in the 4x400 relay race. The 4x400 relay is where there's four runners and they each run 400 meters of this race and there's a baton that they pass. The last guy in the race is called the anchor leg, or the last woman is called the anchor woman, and what, uh, the anchor leg. And uh, their goal, it's either the fastest person on the team or the person with the most experience in running. And their purpose is to push it as hard as they can, as fast as they can in that 400 meters to give their team the victory. Well, there was a man who was anchoring his team. He was the anchor leg of his team. And when he got the baton and started running, his team was in first place. And instead of running and looking towards the finish line of where he was going, he kept turning around to see where the other runners were. He kept looking behind him. He kept looking beside him. He kept looking to see if he could find where everybody else was at. And you know what happened? Every time he turned his head, the runners behind him got closer and closer and closer until finally he was passed by the person in second place. Odds are if he would have just focused on the finish line and taken off and ran for that, he would have stayed in first place. But instead, he was focusing on the people that he was competing against and it ended up costing him 
the race. And that's what happens to us as well as the church when we spend our time looking at everyone else and pointing out everyone else's sins. We get slowed down, we take our eyes off the place that our eyes should be focused on, and we start to get behind, we start to die. And until we turn our eyes back to where they belong, we are going to continue to get further and further and further behind in the race. We can't do that as a church. We can't be a church that loses its focus, looks at the wrong things, and dies because of it. So how do we prevent that? What does this mean for us personally and a church? The first thing it means is that we as individuals in a church should be more concerned about our sins than the sins of everyone else, especially the sins of those outside the church. We don't need to be pointing out people's sins outside of the church because you know what? They're not walking with God. They don't need to have us pointing a finger at them because it's not going to do any good. It's just going to drive them further from the truth. We need to take that finger and point it at ourselves. Now, there's probably some of you sitting in here saying to yourself, man, I've been running this race for 20 years, and I don't think I've been doing that, but I still feel like I'm getting behind. I still feel like I'm getting behind in the race. And so with that, I want to read from the book of Psalm. I want to read Psalm 119, 105, and it says this. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. All right, so let's say we were lost in the woods, okay? And you had one of those lanterns, those, those kerosene lanterns with the little thing that you turn to make the flame bigger and smaller, okay? And that's what you were carrying for your light. You're lost in the woods, you've got this light. You light that thing up and you're holding it like this. How far can you see in front of you? Not very far. You get a few feet, right? It's enough just to light that stuff around you. So if you want to get out of the woods, what do you have to do? Even though you can only see a few feet, you have to continue to move forward, right? You have to continue to say, I know it's dark right there. I don't know what's there. But as I move forward, the light is going to continue to light my path and I'm going to be able to find my way out of the woods. Well, see, our walk with God is the same way. What a lot of, believe, what a lot of Christians end up doing is they, they become a Christian, they become a follower of Jesus, they light their lamp, they're holding their lamp, They get this little area lit up around them and they stay in that area and they never move because the light has become comfortable for them because this darkness over here is scary to walk through. And so instead of stepping into the darkness and moving forward with the light and allowing the light to light our path, we stand there, we stay comfortable, we stay in the spot we are at, and we don't move forward and take our next steps with God. And God is saying, you know what? If you're in a place where you've been walking with me for 10, for 15, for 20 years, and you've just been standing there with your lantern, holding it, lighting up your area, and you're comfortable with it, and you have not taken the next step with me, that's why you are dying. That's why you are dying, because you're not taking my next step. God's been speaking to some of you about your next step. There's maybe some of you in this room this morning who you know that Jesus has been speaking to you and he's been saying, okay, hey, give me your whole life, just like Eden said when she was leading worship. Give me everything and see what I can do with it. But you're holding off, taking that step because you've got this little area that's lit around you and it's comfortable and it's nice and you don't want to step into that darkness. There's some of you this morning that have been a believer for 5, 10, 15, 20 years and you've not taken this next step of baptism that these people are taking this morning. There's nothing else you need to do to be baptized other than give your life to Jesus. You don't have to wait 5, 10, 15 years. That's the next step he wants you to take. You have to take whatever next step God is asking you to take 
in order to get your breakthrough. And until you do, you're going to be stuck in the same spot watching people pass you over and over and over again. But here's the thing I want you to remember. Your next step is not everybody else's next step. If God has spoken something to you, that's for you and you alone. It's not for your wife. It's not for your kids. It's not for the person sitting next to you. If God has said this is your next step, you need to take it and not worry about what anybody else is thinking, saying, or doing. Okay, what too many Christians do is they say, okay, God has told me, and this is just a dumb example, but God has told me I shouldn't watch any movie that's PG or higher. And so what we'll do is we'll take that and we'll say, oh, therefore that must apply to everybody. And so if anyone goes to a PG movie, we're there to point our fingers at them and say, oh, you're such a terrible person. You know what? God didn't speak that to them. He spoke it to you. That's your step, not theirs. Stop making your step everyone else's step. And so the question that we're going to leave with this morning is, what is God speaking to you? What step is God calling you to take? Where is God calling you to go? Do you struggle with being religious? Do you spend your time looking over at everyone else in the race and, and measuring yourself against them and pointing fingers at them? Is your next step maybe God speaking something different to you, like you need to, to, to whatever, uh, get baptized. You need to just give your life fully and totally to Jesus. Whatever your next step is, you need to take that. And you need to take it this morning. Don't wait. Don't waste.